I think it's very hard to be um, really um, explicit about it. It's still, thank goodness, a mystery. And I think it's nice to have mysteries in life <laughs> and not have it all done in facts and figures. Um, but the certainty is true is that the question of terroir is very important because, as you probably know, we own two chateaux or two vineyards, the Chateau Longobarton and Leoville Barton, and they're both treated in the same way in the same place. The grapes are in a, come from a different place and the two wines are quite, quite different. And that can only be explained by the, the question of terroir. But then people want to know, well, what's the difference in the terroir? And that's a difficult one to answer because take Leoville Barton, for example. We've got um, um, 45, 45 hectares. And there, if you were to take a sample of the soil from the northeastern corner or from the southwestern corner, they might be quite different. So actually, Leoville Barton is not one particular soil. It's just a whole lot of um, vineyards that have been bought over the years. Um, we bought originally a, a share of what was Leary Lascaz. Um, that was in 1826. And we bought, a, I think, about a third share. Uh, and we've exchanged and bought other territory in the meantime. So there's, uh, there's, a, there's a mixture of terroir even in Leary Barton and uh, we try and plant the right vines, i.e. Um, Merlot in the right soil and Cabernet Sauvignon in the right soil and uh, we come up with what we hope is the best wine we can make. Well, of course, apart from everything else, we're very dependent on the good God and the weather he sends us. And um, so it's not only a question of terroir. Obviously, in some years, uh, we have a, what we call a really typical Saint-Julien flavor. And I think all the wines of Saint-Julien have something in common. I think it's more a question of, um, well, Margot, for example, are considered to be rather lighter in, in style um, rather delicate in flavor and everything, and Pauillac is a more robust wine and everything else. But I would defy anybody to guarantee they would be able to recognize which area the wines come from. Some people can make a good guess and um, sometimes get it right, but nobody is um, infallible. So, I mean, there is a difference, but it's not as obvious as that. And obviously man comes into it too, the way he treats his wine the way he treats his grapes once they come in and be ten, get turned into wine, um, that can vary too. So the actual the person, the owner or the, the regisseur or whoever, the, or the maître de chez, does count as well. So there's a mixture. And the Pouillac is more, Pouillac is more robust and Saint-Julien has the, the benefit of both. Now I think, I mean, generally speaking, even um, independent journalists often say, as usual, Saint Julien has made the most um, um, reliable, steady quality without the great variations they have in other areas. And I think that's true. The large proportion of the vines in, um, in Saint Julien are belonging to um, uh, Cri Classé. So they're very, although they're in the Appellation Saint Julien, there are very few that actually aren't Cri Classé, which is quite exceptional. Yeah, but there again, I would say that I'm not infallible, and I don't think anybody would guarantee to recognize longer from Leoville. I mean, as you know, apart from the else, wines don't develop in a straight line like that. They have their ups and downs, they're like children. They go through difficult periods. Um, a typical example was 1982, which was a great vintage when it was made. And then a few years ago, about 10, 12 years ago, people were beginning to say the wines are not holding up well and everything and even one or two big investors sold out their stock and now regret it because it had a second lease of life and those 82s are now tasting fantastic again. So I mean there are ups and downs so it's very difficult to be able to lay down strict rules about it.
Yes, absolutely. Um, could, uh, I will argue with you slightly about the word collector, because I'm afraid, I'm afraid collectors are very often people who have no intention of drinking the wine ever. But it's purely an investment like um, stocks and shares. And that, I think, is a pity. I think wine deserves better treatment than that. But certainly, I think, um, I was actually talking about it yesterday, I think there's a, what I call a plateau at um, a certain level when a wine reaches what people refer to as a peak, but the plateau is actually the opposite to a peak. A peak. The peak is like this, and the plateau is like this. And there are certain wines, again, I go back to 82, for example, that have a long life of drinkability. They have been good, and some people say, we must hurry up and drink them, and, and other people say, oh, no, keep them longer. The answer is just to try and enjoy them over as long a period as you can. I'm probably more for drinking wines before they go on the downhill, because then it's too late to do anything about it. Whereas if you think you're drinking it perhaps too early, you can always wait. It's very hard in a way to recommend, because um, I'm not evading your, your questions, but <laughs> because first of all, people's tastes vary. I, mean, I often say, for example, coffee people tasting coffee, some people have cream or milk in it and other people have sugar in it and they're all enjoying coffee. And same with wine, not that we put sugar or milk in the wine, but wine is, um, has a certain flavor and there's some, you can have two people tasting the same wine and one of the people will say, oh it's coming along nicely, it should be ready in a few years time. And the other people say, no I think it's already reached its peak. So they're not, and there's no hard and fast rule about it and I think it's a pity that um, people are inclined to be um, lacking in the courage of their own convictions. I think people should make up their own mind what they like and not wait to be um, told. I get, I get rather irritated by people who come along, you give them a glass of wine and before they've even smelt it or looked at it, they say, tell me what I'm supposed to find here. Mm -hmm. I say, no, you tell me what you're supposed to find, what you do find, or not supposed to, what you do find, not what you're supposed to find. I think that's very true, and actually in my case it's certainly true that I find I enjoy younger wines more now than I did when I first came to live in Bordeaux. I think then I was impressed by old vintages, and somebody would tell me this is, this is an 1873, and I said, wow, isn't that good? Well, maybe it wasn't all that good, but because it was old, you're convinced it's good. Now I'm more honest with myself, and I say I quite enjoy wines that are maybe only 10, 10, 12 years old. But I've often told people that it's more important to, um, that in fact you get more pleasure out of drinking um, young wines from intermediary vintages, like not the great blockbusters of 2000, 2005, etc., but the 2001, even 2004. They're lovely wines, but drink them at the right time when they're, say, 15 years old. And you get more pleasure than drinking the great wines when they're only five years old, which is a mistake a lot of people do. Yes, no, so wine's coming along very nicely. It's not going to need um, endless years before it's uh, ready to drink. I wouldn't recommend it to drink yet. It's obviously still too young for that. But in, say, in, in 10 years' time, it's going to be a lovely wine. It doesn't have the, um, the big, heavy structure of um, 2009 or 2010, which were exceptional years. But 2008, at the right time, is going to be a lovely wine. It um, is the result of a not so great early summer and a, a fantastic Indian summer which brought on the ripeness at the end towards the vintage and, and very good weather during the actual picking. So it had, it had rather a rather special, um, what would I call it, climate um, configuration. Good wine, good wine. Well, I was, once, I was once asked, actually, at the Wine Spectator meeting in, in New York, um, I, think it was, I think there were about, I don't know how many, a thousand people gathered together, and uh, we were being questioned, 
and uh, the, um, the, the master of ceremonies said to each of us, I think there were five or six of us, of super seconds, I think they were called, um, could you describe in a few words the style of wine you're trying to make at your chateau? And, uh, and I said, I don't need a couple of words, I only need one. Oh, he said, what's that? And I said, drinkability. Wine is made to be drunk, and it's got to be enjoyed when it's being drunk. And I think people should be honest with themselves and not try and convince themselves that because Mr. So-and-so, who's a great wine expert, has said it's good, therefore it must be good to me. I think they should say, do I honestly really enjoy drinking this? Or would I, for example, rather have um, drunk it with different food or in different circumstances? Because that counts too. I think even the company you're in, you know, let's face it, we're all a bit moody. We all have good days and black days, what they call it, something hair days, black hair, what's it called? Bad hair days. Bad hair days. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all have those in which well, no wine's going to taste good. <laughs> yes, I don't think you should force yourself to say, I've got to convince myself the Bordeaux is good. I think it's got to happen naturally. And I think it usually will. I mean, people talk about uh, um, young people's career in wine drinking and very often starts off with sweet white wine and then turns to dry white wine and from there on to uh, Bordeaux, Burgundy, um, California, Chile, Australia I mean. and it's very hard to generalize too if you come to think that I sometimes get irritated I must admit with um, headlines in newspapers saying um, uh, disaster in the French vineyards. What's, what's the French vineyard? Are we talking about Alsace or Champagne or Burgundy or Bordeaux or uh, Languedoc or Roussillon? And French vineyards doesn't mean anything. Well, that, that could be that, but that's a coincidence actually, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I was born in the year 1930, which didn't produce any good wine in any country. <laughs> I mean, either France or Portugal, Spain, Italy, nobody produced good wine in 1930. I had the advantage, I was conceived in 29, which was a great year, so when people talk about your birth year, I say, now I want my, the year of my conception, then we have 29. But um, now that was the year when no, all, all the wines were bad, and 11 maybe is the year when all are good. I must say I hadn't heard that, but that's interesting, yeah.